Hello everyone and welcome. You know, it feels like it's been a while since I've uploaded a video, but even though I feel like I'm a little bit rusty, I hope I can do justice to As a God Might Be uh, by Neil Griffiths. Uh, this is the most recent book that I finished, and following this chat, I will touch base briefly on what I'm currently reading as well as what my plan next read is going to be. Uh, but yeah, As a God Might Be by Neil Griffiths. This was published this year, um, 2017, about a month ago, so late October of 2017 um and i really um was anxious to get to this so it you know the description of it really sounded like something that i would be interested in and um i really wanted to get to this during my um you know my free reading period uh which will end here at the end of november when i move into my december rereads so yeah i'm glad i got this uh got this read during my free reading period um what it's about is um it's about this sort of youngish middle-aged, um, kind of a young middle-aged uh, man, um, he has young children, um, who is this sort of upper middle class um, fellow in uh, London um, who suddenly sort of just big, out of the blue, I guess, becomes compelled to build a church. Um, and so he sets out to do this. He belongs to kind of a affluent middle class um, you know, family and friends, uh, a social group, I guess, in London. And, and you know, it reminded me of um, initially his social group, his friends and his family, really reminded me of a Woody Allen movie from maybe the 70s. If the Woody Allen, you know, these affluent sort of middle class, well-educated, um, sort of urbane people, a uh, group of people, um, and what what would what would happen in the midst of that if one of those um, one of those uh, urbane Woody Allen New York type of sophisticates um, suddenly decided that uh, they had a connection to God and needed to uh, go and build a church, even though they weren't weren't religious, and then you know transpose that into the 21st century instead of the 1970s. These are Londoners, not New Yorkers. Um, <laughs> and you basically kind of got, I think, you know, the feel of, at least this is how I identified with his sort of social group. And, you know, there's a, there's a scene in the book early on where he's describing, he's with all of his friends and they're sort of having this dinner party and sitting around drinking wine. And this really, this banter that they're having really sort of reminded me of a, a Woody Allen movie from the seventies or eighties, but, um, they're all sort of just are hard to believe. They can't really understand where he's coming from when he describes what he wants to do, which is to build this church out in on a, on the seaside um, on the on a cliff top, and you know the reasonings behind that they've all you know it's sort of puzzling to them because it doesn't fit. I think it doesn't fit their normal narrative of not only of what they the normal narrative that they have of of him, but the normal narrative that they have of you know reality itself. So our main character's name is Proctor McCullough, which I right off the bat that's another thing that that really clicked with me because it really sounds um, to me it really sounds as an American it really sounds Puritan. It sounds really um, Plymouth Bay, you know Proctor McCullough settled in Plymouth Bay Colony in 1621. You know, it really sounds, uh, to me, it sounded really Puritan, although Proctor McCullough is no Puritan for sure. Um, like I said, he doesn't really even have a religion or a particular faith, I wouldn't say. He's a kind of a typical um, Westerner, you know, Western, uh, like a Europe from Western European civilization, um, where, uh, you know, I would say more or less most of the worldview for Western civilization is a secular one. And so he's really hearkening back to this uh, being compelled to by God, um, and he uses the word God, although the definition of that is, is discussed really at length of what he thinks God is and what his friends might think he thinks God is. Um, but, you know, feels compelled to go build this church for no particular reason, really, you know, because um, the church, um, he doesn't plan on starting a congregation or starting a new religion or even, you know, participating in an existing religion. He just feels compelled to build this church. So he does set out to go and do this. And eventually on this clifftop, on this seaside clifftop, he is joined by some locals, uh, young people really, who are sort of drifting rudderless in life. I kind of got the impression 
but uh, several of them, there's a core group of them that sort of latch on to him and, you know, really get engaged with this project and building this church. And um, so he winds up spending, you know, sort of dividing his time between um, London and then this sea seaside um, clifftop where they're building the church. And so um, really the book is, is explores these um, relationships, the relationships he has to his family. He has a partner and two small children, like I mentioned, um, and this, uh, a job uh, back in London, um, and, you know, a, a, a friend's net, a friend network of friends who were uh, affluent, sort of secular, worldly people, um, as he is or was. Um, and so how this affects this group of people, and then also the other group of people, the group of young people, um, this winds up, um, you know, having... Um, uh, impacting their lives as well. And this really reminded me of the book that I read recently, Shaking of the Foundations by Paul Tillich. This is actually, uh, one of the sermons in this book is actually quoted in this book, you know, quoted, quoted in As a God Might Be. But, you know, the shaking of the foundations that's talked about in this sermon and the, the title of the Paul Tillich book um, talks about, you know, how the earth's foundations are periodically shaken. I really, you know, applied that to the foundations of his family and friendships, um, his his uh, partner, his children, um, as well as the foundations of these uh, group of four uh, young people. Um, really, all the foundations are shaken during the course of this novel. And um, so it really kind of reminded me of that and, you know, how that adjusts. Because, you know, if you think about it, what would you do if someone you depended on um, out of the blue, sort of just decided to go and do something that you didn't expect at all and that didn't really have um, meaning and couldn't really be verbalized. Um, you know, would you think that they had a mental illness? Um, would you follow them there? Um, you know, and this is all questions that are explored with his partner, especially um, who has these two small kids to care, to care for. You know, and then, you know, the thing is, when you depend on someone, does that make you, you know, feel like you can't depend on them anymore um, when they go and do something that you don't understand and that you're not a part of? So, you know, this is explored really, I think, you know, this idea is explored really at length. So another kind of thought about it was Hesse, Herman Hesse, the novel really reminded me, especially early on, of a Herman Hesse novel, except that Herman Hesse um, was a 20th century person, and this is definitely a 21st century work for the 21st century, I think. Um, but um, this sort of seeking, um, Herman Hesse, you know, seeks spiritual answers in Eastern traditions, largely, at least the books that I've read of Herman Hesse, whereas this character, our character, Proctor McCullough, is not really a seeker, you know, he's really thinks he's found, uh, because he really feels like he's connected with the divine, um, but the divine, you know, God. Um, so God in the sense of the Christian God. So um, I think this reminded me of another book uh, that I read recent, not recently, but um, I think I read this last year. Let me just pull this up because I, I pulled up the cover. Um, I wanted to pull up the cover for you um, just so that we could... Um, well, I'm not going to find the cover. I can't find the cover. Kindle has changed its um, its library, and it's harder to find. Oh, here it is. Um, All Things Shining, uh, Reading the Western Classics to Find Meaning in a Secular Age. So I think what this book is trying to do is, um, at least the book was speaking to me, that it was trying to find um, connection to God, connection to meaning, um, that meaning that really only religion can um, can describe, you know, religious words. It's hard to, to put this kind of meaning into words that are not religious because the religious words are the language that develop to describe this sort of feeling and this sort of experience. And so, you know, things like miraculous, you know, the miraculous, the divine, the transcendent, um, you know, and so this was, uh, this was, I think, um, really a lot of what the, the, the book was trying to, to take. The, a lot of the it was the place that the book was trying to take me, I think, um, in, in a similar way. So um, I already kind of talked about shaking of the foundations, but, you know, this whole idea of um, how I, I really think that this theme of how people, um, 
how people change uh, through time and how a, a relationship is stable and happy. And then something suddenly can happen to someone, as happened to Proctor McCullough, that sort of sweeps him out of that bond and into something else and whether or not that relationship can survive. And, you know, one thing that I really, that I really kind of saw with this was possession, kind of love is possession. There's a lot of discussion about love and different types of love. And I think that that's also explored in this novel, you know, family love, uh, romantic love, sexual love, friendship love, and then this universal love of God, you know, this sort of the universal love. There was a scene in the book, though, that really struck me about this talk. There's a conversation going on at a dinner, um, and the discussion around at this dinner is this whole topic of universal love and um you know this sort of loving everyone no matter what happens to them no matter what they do you know loving your enemies even there's some things that happen in this book that i'll mention here more in a bit uh that really sort of test this sort of limit of of universal love and unconditional love but the thing that struck me in this scene particular scene in the book was that the character proctor mccullough is eating lamb's kidneys and so to me that was just such a shock in a way because it almost actually even made me nauseous because a lamb a little innocent lamb is a is a baby uh, a, you know a, a child really of another species who can feel fear you know who feels fear who can feel pain who can feel terror and this violence that was done to this lamb over this dinner where they're discussing universal love was just so much that it actually made me nauseous um, in that in that spot. So, yeah, I uh, thought that was kind of really interesting, though, uh, that juxtaposition of him eating the lamb and sopping up the juice of the lamb's kidneys um, while discussing this sort of universal, um, unconditional, uh, universal meaning from the universe love, not, you know, meaning it's, it's all encompassing. It's the meaning of life is love. And yet, you know, uh, sort of, ignoring it in this instance of the innocent lamb that had been killed for this dinner to paying no attention really to to it um you know uh, other than just it's something it was something to eat so um yeah i think i i think I, I better stop i'm running out of time um i did mention sort of this love is possession um and i think that was another area that was explored this tension between his family back in london his, between the tension between the people that he met and was connected to at the uh, site of the church. Um, there is one thing I want to mention before we completely run out of time is um, this, um, the cover, the book cover here um, that you can see. This is from a painting by Giotto and it's called Lamentations. You can see the tree on the cover up there in the upper right. And Lamentations um, has a really significant meaning because of something that ends up happening, very tragic, um, eventually in this book that tests the, the bounds of love, of universal love. Um, so yeah, um, I thought that was that was really cool. So yeah, I'm super glad that I that I managed to get this read. It was a big book to read, uh, 600 pages, but well worth the time and investment. So what I'm reading now, uh, let me just see if I can pull it up quick because of the new um, can't seem to navigate the new um, the new Kindle very easily. But there's the Dark Forest uh, by C. Shin Lu. For some reason, I keep losing the cover of this. Um, it's a science fiction work. It's the second in a trilogy. I'm hoping to get all three of them read. So my next read is actually going to be the third in that series, which is called Death's End. The Dark Forest is um, says, In the Dark Forest, Earth is reeling from the revelation of a coming alien invasion in just four centuries' time. The alien's human collaborators may have been defeated, but the presence of the sophons, the subatomic particles that allow Trisolaris instant access to all human information, means that the Earth's defense plans are totally exposed to the enemies. Trisolaris, I just love that. That is, uh, you know, three suns. That's that world is explored in the um, in the three body problem, uh, which is the first of this trilogy. So um, that's my next two reads. I'm hoping to finish out this trilogy before the end of November and then move on into my December month of rereading. Um, so I'll have more on that coming up. I do also have a couple of opera chats to do. So those will be coming up in the very near future. So stay tuned. Take care. Bye.